Well, good evening to each one of you. Uh, this is a special service in the calendar of our church year. And uh, it's uh, special this year because we missed it last year. Uh, we were busy just trying to pull off Easter. And um, so it's good to be gathered again. We're still wearing those things. Um, uh, hopefully the end of that is uh, closer in sight. Uh, but I greet you in the name of Christ. Um, there was, uh, um, I, I was, this evening I was getting ready to put my tie on, which I don't always wear a tie, but I thought I'll wear a tie tonight. And then I realized the one I picked out is I haven't worn that since Christmas Eve. And uh, I remember Christmas Eve, it was raining, and I look out the window and it's snowing. I'm like, you know, what planet am I on? Am I, am I in an alternate universe tonight? Maybe you guys had some of those uh, snow showers as well. Does any of you know what, uh, when we say Monday, Thursday, does anybody know, without looking at your phone, what Maundy means? Oh, do you teach Latin? Okay, that's great. Right. It, 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 it's from the Latin root word, and uh, it, I think it was uh, the form we use is, was closer to the French, but French is built on, on Latin, and that means to command or to mandate, uh, mandi, mandate. Um, that's where we get it. And, of course, it's referring, um, church historically, the term was used because on that night, the this command I give to you, that you love one another, as he washed his disciples' feet. So that's the origin of uh, the word, um, and as we have it in, in the supper. Just a couple of announcements. One is obviously this Sunday is our Easter service. Uh, we uh, are excited about that and looking forward to it. The other announcement is on a sad note, and that is that uh, Claire Brenner died today. Uh, we sent out that uh, email uh, on, uh, on Breeze, and uh, she had had a stroke on Monday. Uh, arrangements will be uh, uh, taken care of in the near future. There's no uh, rush on that. Uh, Claire, I, I believe, was a charter member of our church, not that that makes her more important than someone else, but it is significant. She and her husband, Fred, who preceded her in death, go all the way back to 1984 in May when uh, Reformed Presbyterian Church became a, a particular church. And uh, she was uh, just a wonderful person that blessed uh, our congregation, whether you knew her or not, you know people like that. And uh, she certainly blessed uh, RPC, and we can rejoice tonight um, that uh, she is with the Lord, and uh, we rejoice in the hope of the resurrection of all the saints. As we begin tonight, um, our theme is comes from, uh, it's actually my sermon title, and that's the word alone, alone. These words from Tom Wright, who wrote a series of brief commentaries. This is Luke for everyone. As he describes the chapters we'll be looking at tonight. What emerges from this whole picture is the sheer loneliness of Jesus, both at the supper for which he had longed and as he goes off to wait for betrayal, arrest, and all that would follow. There are times when all Christian work carries this element when the one entrusted with a vision, a vocation, a particular ministry, finds that he or she has to carry it forward despite misunderstanding, opposition, doubt, denial, even from close friends and associates. Those who want to be bearers of the promise must be prepared for this puzzle. It seems to be built into the fabric of how the kingdom has come and will come, part of Jesus' own vocation that he would bear the weight of Israel's and the world's sin and shame was that he should do so alone. And the word alone seems to gain, to gain new depths as we read this story. Call to worship tonight is from Isaiah 53. 
this prophecy of Jesus and we do it responsively. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Let us pray. Father, we come into your presence this evening. Uh, we come to glorify the risen Christ. We come to acknowledge uh, the suffering and the aloneness that he went through for our sakes. It's only because of that that we can gather tonight around the table, even as he commanded us to do. Receive our worship. And may it be from grateful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn 247, uh, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Our hymns tonight, uh, the two metal hymns are printed for you in the bulletin because they may not be as familiar. So you have the music there if that means anything to you. The, uh, the other hymns we will have up front uh, per usual. O Sacred Head Now Wounded. <laughs> Luke 22, 14 to 38. When the hour came, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will, will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also rose, arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are, the, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on, th on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And he said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. And the disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Our next hymn is found printed in the bulletin. Uh, who is this so weak and helpless? I'll be reading the second and third verse, and we'll all be singing the first and last. this a man of sorrows walking sadly life's hard way homeless weary sighing weeping over sin and satan's sway tis our god our glorious savior who above the starry sky is for us a place preparing where no tear can dim the eye who is this behold him shedding drops of blood upon the ground is this despised, rejected, mocked, insulted, beaten, bound? Tis our God, who gifts and graces on his church is pouring down, who shall smite in holy vengeance all his foes beneath his throne.
Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance, but when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. be seated. I want to ask you this evening if you have ever been alone in a crowd and you felt very lonely. Most of us have and usually when that happens it's because we don't know anybody else in the crowd. But have you ever experienced, have you ever been at a gathering of 
close friends or family, people who know you and love you, and yet you still experience feelings of intense loneliness. Probably some of you have been there before. How is it that you can be around so many people, even people who you know and love, and still ex experience the sense of being all alone? I'm not a psychologist, but I think that that happens when there is a disparity between the burden that you alone are bearing. It could be that you're in grief, could be that you're in fear, could be that you're experiencing anxiety over an issue that no one else really understands, or maybe they don't even know about it. And there's a disparity between that weight or burden that you bear compared to the company that you're in, okay? Or the conversations that surround you. Suppose you're there at Christmas time with a family, and yet you know that you're going to lose your job soon after New Year's. Money's already tight. And you felt a lump under your armpit a few weeks ago, and you're still waiting for the doctor's phone call. It's not that no one else cares. They just don't understand or know the weight of what you feel. And so their happy conversation or their annoying company makes you feel alone in your circumstances. We don't know when it started, but we do know that by the time of the Last Supper, Jesus is beginning to feel alone in his burden, despite the company of those he loves. And they love him. I'm not saying that he's depressed, but in the two consecutive passages that we just read earlier in our service, there is an increasing isolation, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that Jesus is undergoing. This is one of those between the lines sermons, in the sense that the text does not specifically say this, or say the word alone, or make this the actual substance of the words or the sentences. But if you follow the progression of the narrative from the meal and Jesus' utter seriousness about the weight of increasing sorrow, and you compare that to the disciples' complete disregard and distractedness, including silly arguments about who's going to be the greatest, you begin to feel the disparity between the burden of Jesus and those he is with. From the table to the garden, the disciples seem confused and out of touch. And then comes the arrest. And one of the 12 betrays Jesus with a kiss of all things. And then the swords are drawn. And later Peter's denial, Jesus is progressively being isolated, physically, emotionally, spiritually, leading all the way to his aloneness at his trial and eventually the aloneness on the cross where he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? The hymn that we just sang, and the reason I chose it, even though it may not be familiar to you, is that it used the word alone twice. Throned upon the awful tree, king of grief, I watch with thee. Darkness veils thine anguish face, none its lines of woe can trace. None can tell what pangs unknown hold thee silent and alone. Silent through those three dread hours, wrestling with the evil powers, left alone with human sin, gloom around thee and within till the appointed time is nigh, till the Lamb of God may die. And the third verse, which I didn't include, 
is the cry of Jesus in his aloneness. Hark, that cry that peals aloud upward through the whelming cloud. Thou the Father's only Son, thou his own anointed one, thou dost ask him, can it be? Why hast thou forsaken me? Tonight I just want to look with you at this progression, not in great detail, um, and make a few comments on the nature of the aloneness that Jesus experiences. Number one, he's alone in his eagerness and his passion to have this supper with his disciples. It had been an exciting week. There was Palm Sunday. There's been other events since. There's been discourse and arguments with people who are challenging Jesus. But Jesus is most of all looking forward to this supper. And he says in verse 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, he wants them to know, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I won't eat it again until it finds fulfillment, this supper, in the kingdom of God. They don't really know why Jesus is so eager. They've had a lot of Passovers in their life. They've had some with Jesus. And here he is talking about his eagerness and his suffering and this foreboding kind of mood. We won't eat it again until um, Jesus is alone in his desire for this supper, his eagerness. Back in chapter 12, verse 50, uh, Jesus said, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. See, this has been building in Jesus, and now it is only hours away. This eagerness that no one else shares. He's also alone in his understanding of his mission. In verses 19 to 21, we, those familiar words of the supper, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took a part of what was ordinary within the Passover meal, and then he said those words about himself. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It was the third cup. It was the cup of thanksgiving. And he reinterprets that cup in terms of himself. Um, this is a farewell meal for Jesus. And it's also the Passover meal, which becomes representative of what he's about to accomplish. He's actually reinterpreting the Passover and saying all these ages and ages, it's been about me <laughs> and this moment. And the Passover meal was never the same again. But the disciples can't understand that. We, we can only note that. We can't criticize that. How are they supposed to understand that? They knew less than we knew. And Jesus knows that, okay? But he still feels the obligation to say these things to them and to prepare them and to continually let them know, I'm about to do something that you don't understand right now, and it's going to be awful, but you will see me on the other side. But no one else gets it. So he's alone in that. He's also alone in his servant spirit. Paul in Philippians 2 says that Jesus came to us in, in very nature servant, being born in human likeness. He's very nature servant, which harks back to the Isaiah prophecies about the suffering servant uh, who would come. And in John 13, uh, where Jesus washes their feet, there's all this servant imagery of Jesus doing that washing. And, and, and Peter and others are like, no, you can't wash my feet. I should be washing yours. And he's like, unless I wash your feet, you won't experience the cleanliness that you really need. Um, but look at the spirit that dominates the disciples' thinking and priorities, even as the burden of the cross is growing. 
verses 24 to 27, where this dispute arises about who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to be the MVP of the disciples? We're finally down to the, the final four in the NCAA. And uh, so there's four teams left. It's been an interesting uh, final uh, March Madness. I haven't gotten to see a lot of it, but none of those teams that are there, even in the 64, none of those teams are there with teams that are fighting in envy and rivalry. Okay, they, they've, they've given up who they are to play for the team. I just can't imagine anybody on one of those teams just wanting to play for the stats or his pride instead of winning the game. Um, imagine the patience it took on Jesus' part as he prepares to give his life, and they're thinking about themselves. <laughs> um, that makes you feel alone, even amongst those that you love. Back in Mark the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 38, this argument had arisen at another time, and Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am to be baptized with? Jesus is also alone in his grasp of the gravity and the seriousness of this hour. This is a dark hour. Um, this is an hour where there are things in the balance in terms of people's hearts. It's an hour of darkness, as Jesus says, when darkness reigns. At the table in verse 31, you know, Jesus tells Peter that Satan has asked to sift him as wheat. And Jesus says, I prayed for you um, that your faith won't fall or fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers, and, you know, Peter just kind of blows him off. I mean, he's earnest, but he's, Lord, I, I'm, no, 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 I'm, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. He just doesn't listen. He doesn't get it. Um, and so it's no surprise when they're in the garden and uh, they reach the place where Jesus usually prays, and Jesus says to them, Twice, he says, pray that you will not fall into temptation. There's something at stake in this hour. There are some things that are in the balance. And you guys are taking it way too lightly. Pray. And so he withdrew and knelt and prayed. And, and then he, he, um, we read that as he's praying, he, he, he says to the Father, if you're willing, Father, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Uh, Jesus himself is tempted through his whole ministry, and in all ways like we are, yet without sin. And it's interesting that this, this angel comes to minister him. Um, Luke is the only one who notes that here, but he doesn't note that in the temptation scenes. Matthew notes it in the temptation scenes that an angel came and ministered to Jesus after those three temptations in the 40 days in the wilderness. Luke mentions this angel who comes to Jesus after what we could say is his, his last temptation, his final temptation, where it's in the balance, Lord, if there's another way. There was another way for Isaac. If there's another way, Lord, let this cup pass. He is so anguished that physiologically there is blood mixed with his sweat. And that happens in times of great anguish. This is a serious hour. There's a weight of gravity here that we really have to stop to think about or we just go right past it. And then Jesus comes back from, rose from prayer in verse 45, 
and he finds the disciples asleep. And notice they're exhausted from sorrow. I think they're so confused at this point. And they've seen how sour, sorrowful and heavy the burden is on Jesus as he gets closer to the, to the cross and to his arrest. That, that they, they see that and they are sorrowful, but they're not praying. And he says, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. There's something at stake. And only Jesus realizes it. And in that, he is all alone. He's alone also in his understanding of the kingdom. Judas comes with a crowd of soldiers, soldiers who are armed, swords, clubs. He's betrayed by a kiss of all things, by one of his own, and with a kiss. Talking about passive aggressive. The disciples, verse 49, say to Jesus, when they're there, he says, um, Lord, should we strike them with our swords? Um, the backstory to this is a difficult passage that we don't have time to really cover tonight, but the backstory was back in verse 36, 35 to 38, actually, where Jesus says, Remember when I sent out the 70 and I said to you, you know, don't go. Go without a purse or a bag or sandals. You won't lack anything. And, and I met your needs, right? And they said, yeah. And Jesus says, but now, if you have a purse, take it. And if you have a bag, take it. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. That's the gravity of the hour, okay? Now, he's not, he's not, um, it, it feels confusing because he's saying, oh, oh, so they are supposed to have swords. He, what he's talking about is their future. They, they are going to go out, and they're going to go out into all the world. They're going to need swords. They're going to have to fend for themselves and take care of themselves. And the swords here are really more metaphorical than they are literal. And we know that because Jesus says that I was numbered among the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. And the, and the disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. Jesus says, that's enough. That's enough. Basically, that's what he says in the garden. He says, that's enough. Uh, verse 51. Well, actually, in verse 50, one of them struck the servant to the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus said, hey, no more of this. He touched the man's ear and, and he healed him. Um, and he said to the chief priest and the temple guards, would come. He says, am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? I mean, you, you don't need those. We're not, we're not here to have this some sort of a fight. The point is that in the hour of urgency and crisis, Jesus is ready for the cross and giving himself, and the disciples are ready for a fight. <laughs> They're ready for a fight, which would have been a hopeless fight but they're ready for a fight. Jesus is alone physically because his disciples scatter. And the only one who dares to follow at a distance and sit in the outer court by the fire eventually denies Jesus three times. And he has the bitter agony of having Jesus turn his face towards him as the rooster crows, as Jesus had prophesied, and in that moment, in that moment, Jesus is completely alone. He's betrayed by one of his own. He's surrounded by selfish arguments at the table. He's forced to see false confidence of his disciples. He's including, uh, including their prayerlessness and their sleep. And now they have drawn swords and they've lopped off an ear. And one of his own denies him three times when given the opportunity to say, yes, I know Jesus. Yes, I know Jesus. But as Jesus has said to the soldiers, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus, in essence, gave them this hour. He hands them the hour of darkness by surrendering himself in that moment. 
Aloneness is part of the curse. Being alone, being separated. Think of the garden, separated from God, separated from others, separated from creation because they're going to die because of their sin. Um, Jesus bore that curse for us. Jesus had to be alone for it to be the curse that he bore. He had to be alone. That's why the promise of heaven is so precious. Because when Jesus comes again, he will not only wipe away every tear and take away death and mourning and crying and pain, Revelation 21.4, but those who trust in Jesus will never be alone again. Never. Clara Brenner will never, never be alone again. She's in the company of angels, and in a multitude so great that no one could count it. Revelation 8 and 9. 8 and 9. We will never be alone because God himself will be with us, and he will be our God. And we won't be in a crowd and feel alone. There will be a crowd. We won't ever be amongst loved ones and feel alone in our burden or our anxiety because there will be none of that in the new order because the old order passes away. There will be only joy, joy that is shared, renewal that is experienced, and knowing and being known in the new community of heaven and the new community of the new earth. That will be ours. That will be yours. Because Jesus was alone for us. He bore that curse. Let's pray. Father, take uh, these words of your gospel, which show us the gravity of our sin. It shows us the immeasurable love and grace that you have poured out for us. May that disparity draw us to your throne in repentance and praise to lift up and glorify the name of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'd like to ask the elders who will be helping to serve communion if you would come forward and, and sit in the front row here. It's always a joy to celebrate the Lord's table together, and especially so on Monday, Thursday, when we celebrate the anniversary, as it were, of, of the Last Supper. What a delight it is. Now, in years past, we've done this differently. Typically on Monday, Thursday, we all gather together as one big huddle in the front of the church. Uh, we won't be doing that this evening, so just a word on how we will be conducting this. Uh, we'll be kind of going back to what we sort of did pre-COVID, if you can even remember back that far. Um, where we'll have Tom and myself will be beside the table and the two other elders beside us with the, with the, um, with the cups. Um, so we're going to ask if you would, if the middle and this section would come to this aisle and, and come forward here, and for these sections to come down this aisle to receive and then uh, return on the wings. Um, again, we, we used to do it that way back in the good old days of 2019. Um, Tom and I will be using tongs to take the bread and place it into your hand so we don't have to worry about um, extra touching going on and stay as, as touch-free as, as we can. So, but besides the mechanics of how we go about this, let's not lose sight of what it is that we're celebrating here this evening. And of all the great promises that are represented in the Lord's table, one of them is the, the promise that we are not alone. We're the opposite of alone. What this represents is that we have communion with the Lord. 
and communion with one another. That we share in this incredible fellowship, this incredible union with our Lord and this fellowship with one another. It's the exact opposite of alone. So whereas Jesus may have indeed come to the Last Supper with a, with a real sense of being alone, low in the company of friends, we don't share that same aloneness. At least we ought not to. Because we know that we have fellowship with the Lord and with one another. And so as we come tonight, let's, let's bear that in mind. For many of us, it's been a year that we've been apart, that we have felt isolated and alone. But as we celebrate this, let's, let's indeed take God at his word, that we have fellowship with him, that we are not alone. Even though we have gone through all sorts of social distancing, the bonds of fellowship are stronger than that. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we're so thankful for this meal, this sacrament that we are about to partake. Lord, we're thankful for your great promises. We're thankful that you were alone so that we would not have to be. Lord, we're thankful for this fellowship of believers, and we're thankful for the fellowship of believers worldwide and throughout the ages. We're thankful, Lord. And we are thankful because of Jesus, and so we pray in his name. Amen. I would just add it as, as well that um, as you come to the table, you don't all have to get up at once and get in line. Like, just uh, maintain some distancing between people, and you can get up when it seems appropriate for you to uh, get in line in one of these two aisles. So, but we just want to be respectful of that uh, with each other. On the night on which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, as we've done in his name, he broke that bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup. It was one cup and he shared it with his disciples and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. I want you all to drink of it. If there are any who would prefer to take communion in the former way with just the plastic cup, you are welcome to do that. And those cups are up here at the center of the table. You can just take that and go back to your seat. Um, and there's also a gluten-free uh, wafer that's up here as well.
is there anyone else who needs to be served where they are? Raise your hand. Parents, I really like having the children in our church. I want you to know, like, even if we compete for sound space sometimes, that having your children here, for me as a pastor, is a joy. Um, so please, please know that. Um, so let us pray at the close of this meal. Father, we have feasted together, and we have done that in the name of Jesus knowing that through his Holy Spirit that his grace is present here in this service and as we partake, um, to remind us anew of the truth of your promises. That this really happened. These promises are true. They are yes in Christ. You did die. You did shed your blood. It does have meaning more than just love. It forgives sins and draws us near to you, removing the barrier that stood in all of our way. Refresh us, we ask. Um, may we go forth from this place ready to serve the living Christ who gave himself for us. For in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. We will stand and sing our closing hymn. These words of peace, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You have a blessed evening.